Carol. Before we get into question period, I just want to say this is my first time in the chair with a question period. <laughs> so please. Get it, get it out of yourselves. Get it out of yourselves. That's good. Get the energy, get the energy out. That's good. Get the energy out. Uh, and I just bear bear with us as we, we do it, and I just hope that uh, we can have a great question period. Oral questions, question oral, l'honorable. The Honourable Member for Megantic L'Erable. And congratulations, Mr. Speaker, on your appointment. Mr. Speaker, we're currently facing an increase of COVID cases in Quebec and Canada. Many countries have started administering third doses to all adults. A new variant from Africa is generating enough concern that the WHO is holding an emergency meeting today. Israel and the UK have closed their borders to six countries. The Liberal government has a history of reacting too late when there are signs of a crisis. So what is the government's plan to protect Canadians and keep our economy open? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur the Mr. Speaker, the situation with COVID-19 around the world continues to be volatile and unpredictable. The PCR tests required to enter into Canada are capable of detecting cases. And the WHO is holding an emergency meeting today to identify next steps. The minister will inform uh, Canadians of next steps. The, 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 the honourable member for Megantic Lérable. Well, Mr. Speaker, Canadians are worried. We're concerned by that answer. Our economy has been devastated. Thousands of businesses have closed. Unemployment is through the roof. The Liberal government has been slow, slow to warn Canadians, slow to close the borders, slow to provide vaccines. Now, there's still time to protect Canadians who are fed up with lockdowns. So what is the government's plan to prevent a fifth wave that would have disastrous consequences for Canadians' health and for our economy? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our testing at the border is protecting Canadians' health. We know that the fight against COVID-19 is not over. And we're working with our partners across the world to protect Canadians. The situation is evolving rapidly. And we are working very closely with our international partners as well as provinces and territories to monitor this emerging variant. The Honourable Member for Megantic L'Erable. Mr. Speaker, the lessons from the past should direct our action today, not in the future. In Feb February, the government gave $53 million to the Public Health Agency of Canada to do research on variants. Today, there is absolutely no recommendation on this new variant on its public health website. The Minister of Health has been completely silent on the issue, while more and more voices are calling for action to prevent this new wave. The government's inaction has cost our economy hundreds of billions of dollars, and Canadians are still paying for it and will continue to pay for it for a long time. Can the government tell us today what is its plan to protect Canadians and our economy? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that question. Canadians know that our government from day one took decisive action at our border to protect Canadians. And we have put together a, a different measures to protect Canadians. However, forgive me for not taking advice from the Conservative Party that they can't even ask their own MPs to get vaccinated, and they've been asking us to remove PCR testing from pre-departure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kildonan, St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are learning disturbing news today concerning a new COVID variant out of Southern Africa. Countries like Germany, the UK, India, Israel have already taken decisive action to close their borders in coming flights and implement quarantine and testing requirements from those traveling from areas of concern. And yet this government hasn't even updated their travel advisory yet. We are wondering what is going on. What is the plan to keep Canadians safe? We have heard nothing this morning of reassurance for Canadians. We want to know what the plan is. 
The Honourable Minister. Mr. President, it, Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 situation around the world continues to be volatile and unpredictable. We continue to monitor the situation very closely. We'll not hesitate to take action to protect Canadians. The PCR tests required to enter Canada are capable of detecting this variant, and there are currently no direct flights to Canada from South Africa. The WHO held an emergency meeting this morning, and you will hear more from the Minister of Health this afternoon. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. Mr. Speaker, that answer is unacceptable. Countries like Germany, the UK, India didn't have to wait for direction from the World Health Organization to keep their citizens safe. We have seen a decision from this government before with Conservative members of opposition who called on this Liberal government to close the border back in January 2020 for the coronavirus, and they waited three whole months to do so, and by then COVID had spread across the country. Canadians don't want to see that mistake being made again. They don't want to go back into lockdown, Mr. Speaker. The mental health of the nation, the economy of the nation cannot handle that again. Canadians expect decisive action from this Liberal government. What is the, is there a plan? What is the plan to keep Canadians safe from the African variant? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, there is a plan. Canadians have seen our plan over the last year and a half in doing everything to protect their health and safety. And I want to reassure Canadians, Mr. Speaker, there are currently no direct flights from South Africa to Canada. However, I want to ask my honourable colleague, where do they stand? Do they want to open the border or do they want to close the border? Do they want to remove the PCR pre-departure test or do they want to implement PCR? I am I'm not sure what they want, Mr. Speaker, but however, we'll take advice from our doctors and from our experts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Environment Commissioner produced a scathing report about the government's environmental track record. What he found is that it's going to take much more than rhetoric to avoid climate catastrophe. And while the government brags about its outstanding work, the Commissioner was unequivocal. Canada is, and I quote, the country with the worst performance of all the G7 nations. The worst performance, Mr. Speaker. And that's only since the Liberals came to power. How can the government boast about their record when they're the worst in the world? The Honourable Minister. It is not. Mr. Speaker, we welcome the Environment Commissioner's report and want to recognize his work. Uh, this latest report does show a terrible scenario under uh, the former Harper government. They didn't study the 2016 or the 2020 plan. They didn't study the many measures that we've put in place and the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that we've invested, which will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, by uh, almost half. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr. Speaker, the Minister talked about Stephen Harper. Well, let's talk about that. The heart of the problem is that just like Stephen Harper before them, this government is trying to make people believe that subsidizing oil companies will make them less polluting and that they can keep producing more without any problem. But this is what the Commissioner said. Increased production would lead to increased emissions, which runs counter to Canada's commitment to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. When will the government understand that the energy transition is not about moving from oil to more oil, it's about moving from oil to renewable energy sources. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for her question. On the issue of oil subsidies, we agree. That's why our country has agreed to phase them out two years earlier than our G20 partners, so 2023 rather than 2025. We also announced in Glasgow that, like many other countries, we would uh, stop the international subsidizing of oil. Member for North Island Powell River. Mr. Speaker, seniors in Canada who receive the Guaranteed Income Supplement are some of the poorest in this country. Many work to subsidize their meager income. Like every other working Canadian, they asked for help during the pandemic. Now they are being punished. Seniors like David, 71 years old, $1,000 cut off his income. He cannot afford his food. He cannot afford his medication. How can the Minister of Seniors sleep at night knowing that these seniors are going hungry and are not getting their medication every day here? here, here, here. 
The Honorable Minister of Immigration. No? No, thank you, oh, Mr. Online. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank to my honorable colleague for her question and her for advocacy around seniors. From the very beginning, Mr. Speaker, our government has worked extremely hard. Hold on a second. Let's just hold. Let's just hold on a second. Uh, hold on line. I'll let the minister restart. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the honorable member for her question and her for advocacy around seniors. Mr. Speaker, from the very beginning, our government has worked extremely hard to support those most vulnerable seniors, including strengthening their GIS. We know GIS adjustments have been hard on some seniors this year, and I can assure the honorable member that we're working on this issue uh, to find the right solutions to support those affected, and we will be there for them. The honorable member for Windsor West. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and Ministers, in a last-ditch effort, finally went to the United States to deal with Buy America's attack on Canadian auto workers. Instead of improving the situation, their results have the U.S. doubling down on softwood lumber duties that devastate our industries and steal our future jobs. For years, the Liberals have failed to protect families and their livelihoods, and now they're letting them take it on the chin from U.S. protectionism. When will this government wake up and truly support value-added industries, not just with talk, but with real plans to support our workers and their families? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of International Trade, Export Promotion and Small Business Economic Development. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for his question. Um, I also want to thank the Honourable Member and look forward to working with him as, uh, as uh, my Honourable Critic. Um, in a relationship as large and as significant as the one that Canada has with the United States, of course there are challenges, but we have worked together over many years to resolve many of these challenges, and we have been successful. We're going to do that again here, whether it is the electric vehicles, whether it is softwood lumber, whether it is our relationship in fighting the things that we have in common, like climate change, like finishing the fight against COVID-19. Let me be clear, we're always going to have the back of Canadian workers and businesses. We've always done it. Today's no different. We're always going to do it. Here, here, here. The Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etchemins, Lévis. Well, the government gave us a bland uh, speech from the throne. My bu businesses in my riding and in Quebec are tearing their hair out. Why? Because they can't find anyone to fill thousands of vacant positions. No one. 200,000 jobs are available in the province. The Quebec government has announced $3.4 billion to fight the labor shortage. But in the throne speech in this place, there wasn't a word about the shortage. The government is dragging its feet on this issue. Why is it letting businesses down? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Before I begin, let me say it's nice to see a fellow blue noser in the chair today. Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for her question, but I would point out that Canada has now recovered more than 100% of the jobs lost during the pre-pandemic, uh, peak of the pandemic rather, but we still suffer from the same labour shortage that is affecting competitive economies right across the world. In order to address the labour shortage, we have a number of facets to our plan, including investing in childcare so hundreds of thousands of Canadian parents can join the workforce, including boosting economic immigration levels so we can find workers to support Canadian businesses, including investing in skill training and including supporting businesses that are hardest hit by the pandemic. Mr. Speaker, all these measures have one thing in common, the Conservatives routinely voted against them. Uh, uh, the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Etes, Chemin Lévis. Mr. Speaker, I'll have the government understand how serious the labour shortage is. Let me tell you about the company Rotobec in my riding in Saint-Justine. It makes manufacturing equipment and it does business in 40 countries. But it can't take this situation anymore because there are nearly 30 jobs it needs filled. That means its growth is limited, it needs to turn down contracts, and its employees are worn out. What would this government say to Cathy Roberge, who's the human resources manager at Robo uh, Rotobec? What would they say to her? The Honourable Minister. When it comes to jobs, it's important to remember one of the great successes of our country. When COVID-19 hit Canada, we lost 3 million jobs. Today, Canada has recuperated all of those lost jobs during the pandemic, 
we have recovered 101% of jobs. And compared, this is compared to the US where they've only recovered 81% of jobs. We will continue to work very closely with the province of Quebec on the labor shortage issue. We will solve this uh, issue with immigration and, of course, uh, work on the labor shortage. Calgary, Mindenpore. Mr. Speaker, the Globe and Mail has reported that job vacancies have soared to unprecedented numbers with more than one million unfilled positions. Vacancies jumped by 16.4 percent in September alone. When will the minister admit the government's plan for labor shortage just isn't working, take responsibility and fix this problem? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Mr. Speaker, what the Conservatives seem unwilling to recognize is that there is a global phenomenon caused by interruptions to the supply chain due to the COVID-19 pandemic that have caused labour shortages in economies right across the world. Thankfully, as the Minister of Finance just shared in our other official language, more than 100 per cent of the job losses from the peak of this pandemic have now been recovered. In order to help solve the supply of labour shortages that we're seeing in Canada, we intend to invest in immigration to bring more workers here. We intend to invest in child care to open up the workforce to more parents, and we will invest in skills training. And I hope the Conservatives finally see the light of day and start supporting these essential measures. Honourable Deputy to Calgary. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Mittenpore. The Globe and Mail indicated that a fifth of all vacancies were in hospitality, including restaurants and hotels. Despite a hectic tourist season in Alberta, restaurant owner Stéphane Prevost had to close his restaurants for as many as two days a week this summer because there simply weren't enough workers. Why is this government always too little, too late, when it comes to helping employers and Canadians? Yeah. The Honourable Minister of Tourism. Mr. Speaker, in Western Canada alone, more than $775 million went to our region under the Recovery Relief Fund. That helped more than 40,000 jobs in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, and supported 9,000 businesses. Our government will always be there to support businesses in Western Canada, whether it's through the supports, through investments, through childcare, through immigration, immigration. We will be there for workers and for businesses, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, even though this government won't acknowledge it or try and solve it, we are in a labour crisis. Apple and cherry growers left fruit on their orchards this summer. We have restaurants that are reducing their hours. Construction companies are turning down business, and there are help wanted signs everywhere. This is occurring in my community of Kelowna Lake Country and also across the entire country. Does the government plan to stand with small businesses and small farming families and address this labour crisis, or will they continue to sit by and and go forward without any kind of a plan that they can show us. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, thank you for the question. We absolutely are focused on supporting Canadian small businesses and Canadian workers. It is worth reminding everyone in this House of the success of Canadian businesses and Canadian workers in recovering those three million jobs that were lost during the COVID recession. 101% recovered. That is great news for Canadians. And when it comes to supporting small businesses, I would just like to take this opportunity to urge all members of this House to support Bill C-2. Small businesses in BC, in Alberta, across the country need that support. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, with the important holiday shopping season beginning, our small businesses were looking for more than empty words from the throne speech. Right. When it comes to addressing a supply chain crisis, in Canada, this crisis started well before the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's further exacerbated now with the devastating floods and landslides in British Columbia. The lack of a plan is especially deafening. When will the Liberals finally address the supply chain delays that are hurting Canadian small businesses on the road to recovery and growth? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, that was a bit of a kitchen sink question with lots of elements thrown in, but let me try to take them in turn. When it comes to the flooding in BC, we are there working with the province of British Columbia. The Prime Minister will be there today. 
When it comes to supply chain issues, we are monitoring that very, very closely. And let me point out, this is a global phenomenon. All Canadians appreciate that. Finally, on small businesses, one way we can all help them right now is vote for Bill C-2. The Honourable Member for Abitibi-Témiscamingue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The increase in softwood lumber tariffs is serious for Canada, but it's especially bad for Quebec. The company that's been most attacked by the Americans is Résolu, which is in my region. And there's no reason for this, Mr. Speaker. The practices of the Quebec forestry industry are irreproachable. We set our stumpage fees at auction, just like the Americans, and we do this specifically to respond to their concerns. Does no one in Washington really know about this? How is it that no one at the federal level is standing up for Quebec to the Americans? The Honourable Minister. Monsieur le Président, notre gouvernement. Mr. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of the forestry industry and the softwood lumber industry in particular for Quebec. We will continue to defend the resiliency and innovation of the Quebec forestry sector which exports more than $10 million uh, worth of forestry products and provides livelihoods to over 60,000 workers in the province. The Honourable Member for Abitibi-Témiscamingue. Mr. Speaker, the worst thing is that the Prime Minister met with President Biden just last week and they supposedly discussed the softwood lumber issue. Not only did the Prime Minister fail to convince Biden to drop the tariffs, the President actually doubled them targeting Quebec's forestry industry. In addition to threatening jobs in Quebec, this tax increase on lumber, at a time when demand is still very strong in North America, will further increase prices. We saw the consequences of this last week. So what will it, or last year rather, so what will it take for the Prime Minister to finally stand up for Quebec? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government will always stand up for the forestry sector. We will always stand up for their workers. We have presented challenges before KUSMA, before the WTO, where it's been ruled that Canada is a fair trading partner. We absolutely, we absolutely denounce these tariffs. They are unfair. They are unjustified. They hurt workers and businesses on both sides of the borders. I've been speaking to Quebec industry and workers on this very matter, and I will continue to stand up for their interests. The Honourable Member for Destiny, Destiny, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with the announcement of softwood lumber tariffs doubling, we see again how this government is failing Indigenous people. North Sask Forest Products, a 100% First Nations owned company in my riding, has millions of dollars held in tariffs. The government's failure to no negotiate a softwood lumber agreement is costing the nine ownership nations the ability to invest in their communities. Mr. Speaker, I've been asking this question for two years, but I'm going to ask again. Can the minister tell the leaders of these nations when they will get their money back and when these punitive softwood lumber tariffs will finally end? Good question. Honourable Minister of International Trade. I want to thank the Honourable Member for that question. Uh, I have been speaking to the industry, including the industry represented uh, and advocated by the Indigenous uh, softwood lumber uh, members. Um, the Conservatives can shout talking points all they like, but it is the Canadian softwood lumber industry, including the Indigenous softwood lumber industry, that will give me and this government the negotiating mandate on this issue. I will work closely with the industry, as I always have, and we will continue to pursue in their interests. The Honourable Member for Kenora. Last week, last week, the Prime Minister visited Washington to meet with President Biden, and this week, the U.S. has announced plans to double tariffs on Canadian softwood lumber, threatening jobs in Northern Ontario and across the country. So it's either, either the Prime Minister doesn't care to stand up for Canadian workers or is incapable of delivering results. Mr. Speaker, the government has said that they have raised this issue with the U.S. administration. So why isn't the President taking them seriously? Good question. Yeah. The Honourable Minister of International Trade. Mr. Speaker, this issue is a priority for our government. It is why we're pursuing litigation under Chapter 10 of KUSMA. 
I can't hear the answer, so if the minister could restart that. The Honourable Minister of International Trade. Mr. Speaker. This issue is important. It's why we're pursuing it under Chapter 10. But this is only possible because this government fought hard to keep the dispute settlement mechanism in the new trade agreement so that we can stand up for Canadians. I want to remind this House and Canadians that Conservatives urged the government to capitulate to Donald Trump and get a weaker deal. We did not. Our government will always stand up for Canadian workers and the software the software lumber industry. The Honourable Member for Miramichi, Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, over 22,000 New Brunswick jobs are going to feel the impact of this government's inability to stand up for them. There are thousands of jobs in Miramichi, Grand Lake and across the country that are now at severe risk because of the weakness of our current Prime Minister. That's right. Printing more money? Newsflash will not fix this issue. What will the Liberal government do to protect these hard-working forestry jobs? The Honourable Minister of International Trade. Mr. Speaker, to the forestry sector industry and to the workers, my message to you is that we will continue to stand up for your interests. We are interested in an outcome that is acceptable to the forestry industry and to their workers. We are going to work with the Canadian Softwood Lumber as we have always done. It is they who will give us the mandate to take to the United States on this very issue. I'm going to keep working closely with industry. Together, we're going to take a Team Canada approach, just as we have done all the way along, challenging on this issue and to continue to work on them. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkameen, Nicola. Mr. Speaker, this minister just doesn't get it. My region and province has been suffering for years due to the inaction of this government on the softwood lumber dispute. Yet when the Prime Minister promised hope and met with President Biden, the American leader said their relationship was easy and then jacked up the tariffs on Canadian wood. Why did the Prime Minister not get a deal on softwood lumber when he met with the President? Failure Mr. Speaker, is not an option for the workers in my area. Why is it for this Prime Minister? The Honourable Minister of International Trade. Mr. Speaker, I think Canadians will know who is defending them and who has always defended them. When we retaliated against the U.S. on unfair U.S. aluminum and steel tariffs, the current leader of the opposition urged us to stop fighting back. When we were negotiating for a better Kusma deal, the Conservatives wanted Canada to capitulate to Donald Trump. Our government has a proven track record to negotiating outcomes for the benefit of Canadian businesses and Canadian workers, whether it is renegotiating NAFTA, getting a good deal on CPTPP, getting a good deal on CETA. We're going to continue, to continue doing this work for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, Indigenous communities across Canada continue to be at the forefront of the climate crisis. The ongoing flooding in BC has devastated First Nation communities who are waiting for help to clean up and a plan to face future climate events. Mm -hmm. This week, I asked the government to listen and work with Indigenous leaders like Chief Roxanne Harris from Staminas First Nations. Staminas First Nations and others have not received the support they need. When will this government follow through with their promises? The Honourable Member of Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my heart goes out to everyone who has suffered so tremendously through this flooding experience, including Indigenous people who are disproportionately impacted by uh, not just this uh, climate-related event, but many, many others. My team has been working very closely to coordinate services with the province of BC and indeed has uh, announced uh, funding from $4.4 million through the Emergency Management Assistance uh, Program to the BC First Nations Emergency Services Society. This is built in the principle, Mr. Speaker, that Indigenous people know how to support their communities and will continue to work through that Indigenous-led lens. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Mr. Speaker, extreme weather is hitting both the east and west coasts. The Environment Commissioner just released a scathing report on Canada's climate inaction. It said, we can't continue to go from failure to failure. We need action and results, not just more targets and plans. The Liberals have the worst 
record in the G7. This prime minister claims to be a climate leader, so why is he continuing to give billions of dollars to big oil and gas? Why is he dragging his feet on fighting the climate crisis and supporting workers? L'honorable ministre de l'environnement et changement climatique. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for, for her question. Uh, in fact, I challenge anyone in this House to show, a, to show me a country that has done more in the last four yeah. years to fight climate change than Canada has done. Excellent. Record level investment in public transit, Mr. Speaker. Record level, le level investment in electrification. Let's just, let's, let's just hold on a second. You can restart. Record level investment in, in electrification of transportation, in nature-based solutions, in adaptation to climate change, four billion dollars, Mr. Speaker. But it but the fight is not over. We have lots more to do, and that's what we will be doing. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Toronto Dansworth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On November 28th, four years ago, people from my community and from across our country gathered here to witness our government's apology to the LGBTQ2 community acknowledging Canada's role in systemic oppression, criminalization, and violence against lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirit people. There is so much more to be done. Can the Minister of Women and Gender Equality and Youth share with us what we are doing to support LGBTQ2 communities across Canada? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Toronto Danforth for her incredible work and advocacy and for highlighting this important date. Uh, the discrimination that fuels homophobia, biphobia, transphobia must be eliminated and the work starts right here in this House. That is why our government introduced the LGBTQ2 Secretariat in 2017, invested $7.1 million in Budget 2021 to support its work, and $15 million for a new LGBTQ2 Projects Fund. We will continue the work for the LGBTQ2 Q2 communities to create a Canada where everyone can live their authentic and true lives. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal government wasted millions of dollars during the fight against COVID, but it could still recover millions of dollars of that money. For example, a hundred million dollars that was given to the friend of the Prime Minister, Frank Bayliss, or eighty million dollars that were given to another liberal, uh, a friend of the Liberals, the owners of Tango Marketing. These are two contracts that were awarded without a competitive process. And in the case of Tango, the government didn't even get something in return. Taxpayer money doesn't grow in trees. Is the Prime Minister going to recover this money? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate my colleague on his election. Mr. Speaker, if my colleague recalls, he will remember that 30 days after the WHO declared that we are in a pandemic, we invested a billion dollars to support various sectors, including medical manufacturing in Canada. And that supported Medica, Medicago in Quebec City, Novavax in Montreal, Moderna, which moved to Canada. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to protect Canadians' health and safety. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon University. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The new Minister of the Environment has refused to signal his support for the Canadian nuclear energy industry. And he said that it's not up to the government to decide what sources of energy will be used. But before he said that, Mr. Speaker, he said something different. He said it's time to close the particularly thing nuclear power plant. Oh, there's oh, 3,000 okay. families that rely on those paychecks at that plant alone. And there's good jobs across Canada. Will the minister step forward today and support and announce his support of the nuclear industry and the jo good jobs that come with nuclear? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Speaker. As, uh, as someone who grew up in Saskatoon and in the, the, the Honourable Member's riding, um, I certainly understand the importance of the nuclear industry in this country. Certainly, Cameco and other organizations in Saskatchewan are important drivers of economic opportunity for Saskatchewan families. Nuclear is an important part of the electricity grid in this country. This government has invested in the development of small modular reactors. We look forward to seeing those things demonstrated and ultimately commercialized. We look forward to moving forward with non-emitting technologies to ensure that we are fighting climate change, but doing so in a manner that promotes economic progress. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, now that inflation has taken hold and is the second highest in the G7, and because of this government's unbridled spending, Canadians are suffering with rising prices for basic necessities. Does the Prime Minister still maintain at a time when Canadians need a Prime Minister who actually cares mm -hmm. that he does not think about monetary policy? Here, 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 here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, let me start by reminding all members of this House and Canadians that inflation is a global phenomenon right now. It was 4.7% in Canada in October. In the U.S., 6.2%. In Mexico, also 6.2%. In New Zealand, a country very similar to our own, 4.9%. And let me point out that the G20 average is 4.6%, and that's the OECD average as well. Mm -hmm. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Yeah. Speaker, the Globe and Mail is reporting that the biggest price surge in two decades is set to deliver a revenue bounce worth billions of dollars to this government's coffers. Well, while the Prime Minister's Cup runneth over, skyrocketing food prices are hurting Canadian families. Food, gas, home heating are all getting more expensive. The Prime Minister's high tax, high spending agenda cannot be the status quo. Why is he dragging his heels on getting this country's finances under control right here, right now? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to something as serious as the nation's finances, it's important to separate partisan posturing from the facts. We just heard the posturing. Now for the facts. A key fact is that this fall, the world's two leading ratings agencies, Moody's and S&P, both reaffirmed Canada's AAA credit rating. That is an endorsement of our government's prudent economic stewardship, and Canadians should take pride in this collective accomplishment. L'honorable député de Avignon, la métisse Matan. The honorable member for Avignon, la métisse Matan, Matapetia. Mr. Speaker, the mayor of Montreal met with the prime minister this morning, and once again, she asked him to strengthen the borders in order to fight arms trafficking. And that's not the first time that Valérie Plante asked the prime minister to close the borders. Last time was to prevent COVID from entering Quebec. And in the end, she had to send uh, t city of Montreal workers to the airports to do the job that the federal government should have been doing. I hope that this time, when it comes to fighting weapons trafficking, the federal government will do the job that it should be doing. Le public. Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I would like to assure my colleague that we will be working hard to combat weapons trafficking. To fight smuggling, we have invested more than $350 million. Thanks to that funding, We have added more than 90 service members. On one hand, the Bloc Québécois wants action, but on the other hand, it doesn't support federal investment at the borders. How can my colleague explain that? Thank you. The Honourable Member, member for Avignon, la Métis Matane Matapédia. Mr. Speaker, we need to do much more, and we need to do it now. Fighting weapons smuggling at the border is one of the most important responsibilities of the federal government. Illegal weapons were used in the various tragedies that have occurred in Montreal. They are not allowed, they're illegal, and yet they are there in our neighborhoods. Montreal and Quebec are doing everything they can, but if the federal government doesn't play its role, weapons will continue to circulate in our neighborhood streets. Will this government finally commit to doing everything it can at the border? The Honorable Minister. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Speaker. We are always ready to work together with the Bloc and all the members in this House to work together with the government of Quebec to do everything that we can do to put an end to firearms violence. That is this government's commitment, and we will deliver on it. Member for Thornhill. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we were 
slow to close our borders when COVID-19 emerged. Our allies did it in January 2020. We waited until March. The World Health Organization has called an emergency meeting today to discuss the South African new variant, but the government of Canada's own travel advisory doesn't even mention it. No mention of additional caution, screening, or any new restrictions at all. When the world acts, Canada watches and waits. When will this government finally act to protect the health and safety of Canadians and focus on our economy? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, I want to congratulate my colleague on her appointment as the transport critic, and I look forward to working with her on these and other files that are of concern to Canadians. Let me reassure Canadians, Mr. Speaker, first, that we are on top of this. We have acted from day one. Canadians know that we will never stop taking any measures to protect their health and safety, including testing, including vaccination mandate, including pre-departure testing. So I ask my colleague to work with us on supporting our vaccination mandate, on supporting our pre-arrival test, and making sure that we protect the health and safety of all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Starmount Dundas, South Gungary. Mr. Speaker, after years of delay, Canadian Blood Services has finally announced their commitment to end the discriminatory blood ban. It is a step in the right direction, yes, but questions remain. Health Canada still needs to approve their submission. The government was told back in June that this submission would be coming. If the Liberals care about ending this discrimination with the urgency it deserves, what date can gay men finally donate blood in this country? The Honourable Minister. This government has always known that this was a discriminatory practice and it was up to the scientists and the Canadian Blood Services to take this decision. We're very grateful for them for the proposal and we look forward to giving an answer in due course. The Honourable Member for Stormont Dundas, South Glengarry. I'm sorry, but that was absolutely shameful in that answer. Yeah, yeah. You've always known it's discrimination. You've known for six months that this submission will be coming, and you can't give a date, you can't outline what that process is, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. To the Minister, people are watching and waiting. Leadership is about backing up your words with action. Talk and talk and talk. The solution is there, the medical community is behind it. Stop talking and deliver results. What date will the government say gay men can finally donate blood in this country? I just want to remind the members to ask the questions to the chair and not to refer for, uh, to another member as a you. So the Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, and as someone who has advocated for this for a very long time but understands that we have to wait for science and for the people who, act in, a, in an arm's length agency, it is up to the agency to actually ask us to do this. We, will, we are looking at this proposal and we, we hope to be able to respond as quickly as possible. The Honourable Member for Pontiac. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians can be proud that Canada was so active during COP26 in Glasgow. Canadian climate policy is recognized on the international stage. Our measures are seen as being fair and progressive. Can the Minister for the Environment and Climate Change tell us more about what Canada is doing to fight climate change? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for Pontiat, and I'd also like to congratulate her on her impressive career in the OECD prior to being in this place. Our government has done a great deal regarding fighting climate change. I could say a great deal about what we did in Glasgow. $5.3 billion to help developing countries, including $1 billion to help the poorest countries reduce their dependence on coal as well as a great deal of funding for nature-based solutions. However, like elsewhere in the world, there still remains a great deal to do regarding fighting climate change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Lennox and Addington. Mr. Speaker, Canada's aging population has been the hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic in almost every conceivable metric. Instead of providing the compassion, empathy, and support that the seniors who built this country deserve, 
the Liberal government has sadly penalized Canadian seniors who took CERB Shameful. by lowering the old age security payments. Shameful. Please tell me, when will this government rectify this cruel decision and allow our seniors to collect what they have earned and give them the dignity that they deserve? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is aware, and I think all members of this House would agree, that our seniors have been disproportionately hit by COVID and that they deserve our support. That is one reason that the government supported seniors with $500 over the summer. It is a reason that we have increased the OAS. When it comes to the GIS and the CERB, we are very aware of this problem and we are working very, very urgently to get it fixed. I do also want to say we can all help our seniors by getting vaccinated and Indeed. urging them to get their boosters. Yep. My dad had his recently, and it has been a real relief to me. The Honourable Member for South Shore St. Margaret. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as the first Acadian to assume your role on behalf of all Nova Scotians, let me congratulate you. Hey. Recently, a Nova Scotia Indigenous fishing captain was lost at sea, leaving his crew, uncertified crew, stranded. The winter lobster season opens this Monday in southwest Nova Scotia. DFO officials confirmed that newly licensed moderate livelihood fishers are not required to have their vessels or crew government trained and certified like all other commercial fishermen have to. Why is this government callously placing the lives of Indigenous fishers at risk? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to congratulate the member opposite for his new appointment. And I, I want to say that I have uh, compassion and regret any time someone is challenged with their, as a mariner um, with, uh, with problems at sea, and the Canadian Coast Guard works very closely with the communities to be there uh, for Canadians and mariners. With respect to the moderate livelihood fishery, I want to say that everything we do at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans is underpinned by the conservation of stocks. This is a priority that is... We'll have to, we'll have to work on the time. Uh, the Honourable Member for Peterborough, Kawartha. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our economic crisis has created a mental health and suicide crisis. During the election, I knocked on one man's door and he showed me what he was eating for dinner. Cat food. This isn't an exaggeration, Mr. Speaker. Food bank users are at an all-time high. Canadians need to know a timeline. When will the government take the right action to support parents, children and seniors so they aren't eating cat food? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker. One of the things that our government is moving forward on is affordable childcare across the country. This is something that is so important to address affordability for families right across the country. As a parent, I know the high costs of childcare are limiting for so many people, and we will continue to work hard to make sure childcare is affordable so that families have access to additional resources so that they can provide for their children. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. L'Honorable Député de Sherbrooke. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Having childcare spots helps women to build their career. Being able to access affordable and inclusive childcare makes life more affordable and helps create new jobs. Many agreements have already been signed. Can the Minister for Families give us an update on the implementation of our commitment? The Honourable Minister, I'd like to thank my colleague for Sherbrooke. I'm will, I will be very pleased to give an update to the House today. So far, we have signed nine agreements with the provinces and territories in order to reduce costs for childcare. 
that will help 60% of children in this country. It's wonderful. It will help women to go back to work. It will help our economy, and it will help all of Canada. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Mr. Speaker, our elders from Nunavut are being ex exiled, ex exiled, removed from their families, from their homeland, and from their communities because they cannot access care in the territory. Our elders care homes in Nunavut have been at full capacity since 2017. We have seen in this house countless recommendations and promises made, but we've seen little to no action to help elders and invest in elders infrastructure in Nunavut. Will the Prime Minister respect elders in Nunavut and the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Committee and follow through on accelerating construction on long-term care facilities and seniors' homes in Nunavut? Thank you. But for the question, and I sincerely look forward to working together uh, with the member to solve uh, these many concerns that were brought up. Uh, uh, I'm proud that I am the first ever Minister of Northern Affairs to give the attention to the infrastructure, the housing, the health care, the seniors, uh, all of uh, a gamut of issues that our government is engaged in and committed to work with, uh, with, the, honor with the Honourable Member to, uh, to solve these problems uh, into the future. Thank you.